Adopted by Indians, Chapter 8, What We Ate, Indian Cooking. The Indians always had a supply of food stored up. An Indian might go out and hunt all morning or all day and not get any game, but, when he, but he could always come home and get something to eat. Lots of wild oat seed was prepared and eaten each year. This was an important food to the Chinumnis. The seed was gathered with a basket and a fan-shaped wicker seed beater. The woman held the basket in the hollow of her arm and the seed beater in her right hand. She walked about among the oats, holding the basket below the heads with the mouth opening, sloping forward. With the seed beater, she thrashed the seed into the basket. Many other seeds were gathered in the same way. This is that picture, and this is what it looks like. I bet you guys have seen this before. Um, it's all over the place. So I'm sure the Ohlone people also did the same thing. The oats were stored in baskets and skins and prepared as they were needed. They were generally parched on a flat tray. That means they were dried out. Hot rocks or coals were put on the tray with the oats. The tray was shaken until the covering was burned from the seed and the seed itself was browned. The seed was then winnowed and looked a lot like wheat that had been was badly shrunken. Sometimes they parched the oats and other seeds in stone mortars. I have seen them parch seed in iron kettles they obtained from the whites. The parched seed was pounded in a mortar and was cooked in a basket with water and hot rocks to form a gruel or mush, much like acorn mush. This is what a mortar looks like. So this is what they would have pounded it with. Inside the house would be stored acorns, dried fish, dried game, dried grasses, and many kinds of seeds. Outside was an acorn granary or storage building. The granary was built to hold many bushels of acorns and was used only at permanent villages. Four poles about 10 to 15 feet long were planted in the ground in the form of a square about four feet across. Around these were woven willows, shoots. A bottom was woven into the sides about two feet from the ground. The inside of this wicker frame was lined with tulies or a grass which the squirrels did not like. The acorns were poured in at the top from the baskets in which they'd been carried from the hills. When some acorns were wanted from the granary, the grass would be pulled apart near the bottom and the acorns would run out into a basket. They would then be carried into a, to a shady place to be hauled. That's so cool. It was really a lot of work to prepare acorns for use. I'll show you. Here's a picture of acorns. The, uh, these ones. Um, the acorns were hauled. Oh, wait a minute. Let me see where I. Ah. It was really a lot of work to prepare acorns for use. The women d did all of this. First, they gathered the acorns in the woods and filled their tall, cone shaped baskets with them. This is what the basket looks like. They fitted a net made of milkweed string around this basket. To this net was fashioned a long strap woven of milkweed string. The basket full of acorns was placed on the back and the strap passed around the front of the forehead. In this way, the acorns were carried as far as two or three miles to the granary. The acorns were hauled on a large flat rock in the shade by the stream. They were stood on end on the rock and the top was struck with another rock. The dry hull would crack open and fall away. In the large flat rock were many holes where the hulled acorns were ground into flour. A few hulled acorns were thrown into one of these holes or mortars and pounded with a long slender stick or pestle. The flour was brushed from the mortar with a brush made of soap root husk and placed in a sort of sieve or colander made of fine willow shoots. In this way it was sifted and the coarse particles were returned to the mortar. That's pretty cool. Here's a bunch of pictures you can follow along. We're on number one. So next, so that was number one. And then next, a hollow basin about a foot or more across was made in the sand by the stream. This right here. 
The acorn flour was mixed with water and pounded into this basin. Then several baskets full of hot water were poured over it. The hot water carried the bitterness or leached it out from the flour down into the sand below. The wet flour was then allowed to stand until it had dried into a large cake. When dry, it was lifted from its bed and the sand brushed from it. So here we go, and then here we go. Um, this was all heated. All boiling was done in baskets. These baskets were made by the women and were watertight. Wow, so that you put water in a basket and it wouldn't run out. They had very pretty designs woven into them. Rocks were heated in the fire and dropped into a basket of water or soup. A looped stick was then used to handle the rocks and to stir the contents of the basket. This stick was made of an oak limb doubled in the middle and its two ends fastened together. Cool, like tongs. A small loop was left at the other end. The hot rocks would be caught between two grain sticks and lifted into the basket. Then the contents of the basket would be stirred with the looped end of the stick. When the heat had passed from the rock, it was again caught in the loop and put back into the fire. Wow, so they basically heated the rocks up, they put them in the basket when they were hot, make the liquid in there hot. When the rocks cooled off, they'd put them back into the fire and get another hot rock and put it in there. That's so cool. Wow. The only cooking or kitchen utensils I ever saw the Indians use were baskets and mortars. They used small baskets for dippers and around camp, they drank from them. Here's some back to the baskets. They had many kinds of baskets. They made a sort of colander of cottonwood twigs, a tray, large cooking baskets, a large cone-shaped carrying basket, a small basket used as a drinking cup, and so on. Most of these baskets had very pretty designs on them, almost every kind of design you could think of. When they were soaked in water, they would not leak, and they were almost as strong as sheet iron. Wow, that's so amazing. The Indians kept most of their belongings in baskets and in bags. Their bags were made by gathering up the edges of an irregularly shaped piece of elk or buckskin and tying a string around it. They were of many sizes, from a size that could hold a hundred pounds of acorns down to a size that would hold they could hold in the palm of your hand. When there was an acorn shortage, the seed of the buckeye was prepared and eaten. And here's what the so these are the acorns and these are the buckeyes. Um, these were poisonous and the meal made from the seed had to be leached much longer than the acorn flour. The leaves of the manzanita, manzanita were also powdered and mixed with the buckeye flour and this helped to reduce the bitterness. Otherwise, the buckeye bread was prepared the same as the acorn bread. The manzanita berry was also eaten. A sweet cider was made from the juice of the manzanita berries. They were crushed in mortars and set in, a, in wicker colanders to drain into baskets. A little water was added to the crushed berries. This made a sweet and well-flavored cider, and I remember it with more relish than anything I ever ate or drank with the Indians. Cool. They ate large quantities of young tule roots, which were soft and sweet. The Lake Indians made an almost pure starch from the tule roots. The women waded into the water and dug the roots out with pointed sticks. Other women pulled the roots out onto the bank. There, the women cut the roots from the stalks. The roots were thrown into stone mortars and were pounded into a soft mass. The pounded roots were then thrown into a large cooking basket and were covered with hot water. And again, this is what a mortar is. It's just a, it's a rock that has a hole in it or a dip in it. And then this is called a pestle and that's what they used to grind things with. But sometimes they didn't even have this, you could carry this one around. Sometimes it was just built right into a rock that was on the edge of a stream. Um, let's see, they had a bunch of stickers on the top and a sort of um, husk or hull on them and grew on a long root like beads on a string. The hull was black and the nut seed sweet and rich. The Indians also ate the bulbs of certain wildflowers and when the stems of the flowers had dried, the women would go over the hillsides and dig them by the bushel. 
the Indians would not eat a coyote. I never knew why, but I am sure it was for some reason for it. Pine nuts were eaten in great quantities. After two or three hundred pounds of pine cones had been gathered, they were piled up and fired. The cones were covered with pitch, and this made them burn easily. That's the sappy, sticky stuff on a tree. It was almost impossible to remove the nuts in any other way. The cones were sh covered with sharp spines and were so solid that they could not be opened with anything the Indians had. The coating of the pitch also made them hard to handle. I've always figured that the pitch was the part of the effort of nature to keep squirrels and other pests away from the nuts. After the outsides of the cone had been burned a little, they began to curl open and the nuts would come loose. The Indians would use a stick to rake the cones out of the fire and knock the nuts out. Finally, they would have a pile of about 15 or 20 pounds of nuts for their trouble. So they had to have two or 300 pounds of pine cones to get, to get 20 or 30 pounds of, 15 or 20 pounds of nuts. These they cracked and ate as they were partly roasted. Some of the nuts would were, they would mash and make into mush. This mush was very rich and a person could eat only a small amount of it. Everyone, men, women, and children might eat at the same time and together. They all ate from the same basket, dipping the food out with the three, first three fingers of the right hand, but they generally ate when they felt hungry and generally ate alone. Indians were very careful about polluting a stream near their rancheria or camp. If they had to wade, to wade the stream, they would do so below the camp, or they might cross on rocks above. The sweat house was located below the camp, and all bathing was done there. They would, would very seldom wash their hands and face in a stream. When drinking from a stream, they would arise with their mouths full of water. They would allow this water to run over their hands and would in this way wash their hands and faces away from the stream. One mouthful of water would wash hands and face and leave some to spare. When rock salt could be obtained, it was used for seasoning. Let's see, I have a picture. Um, the Chinumni sometimes used a salt stick instead. The bark was peeled from a small willow limb. This limb was whipped about in the salt grass that grew in great quantities. I couldn't find a picture of salt grass. On the leaves of the salt grass were many small particles of sticky salt. A coating of this salt was accumulated on the stick. The Indians would pull a handful of sweet clover roll it into a ball between their hands and stuff it into their mouths. Then after it had been chewed, the salt stick was drawn through the mouth. They also ate mustard, miners, lettuce, and many other greens, both raw and cooked. The salt from the salt stick grass was dried and was also used for seasoning. It had a sour, salty taste and a good deal, tasted like a dill pickle. Rock salt was highly valued, so this is where you can get rock salt, um, by the Chinumni, and had to be obtained in trade from the Paiutes, who got it by boiling down the waters of Owens Lake. So these are pictures of Owens Lake, and this white stuff here is not snow, it's actually salt. And if you've ever flown over San Francisco Bay, you may have noticed co this color, this is also salt. Um, let's see. They filled a basket with lake water, heated rocks, and held them in the water until cool. This they continued until a cake of mineral salt about the size of a soup plate was obtained. Small game was roasted in the ashes and coals, leaving the skin on. When the meat was done, the skin would be stripped off and the squirrel or quail, here they are, would uh, be as clean and as nice as you would want it. Many times the entrails, that's the inside part, were eaten. They were split open and washed and stewed or broiled over the coals. Meat was broiled on the end of a long, slender wife. The big end of the wife would be set on the ground at some distance from the fire and the meat hung from the other end. The weight of the meat bent the wife over the, I think a wife is a stick of some sort over the um, 
until the meat hung directly over the fire or coals. In this way, the heat from the fire would not burn the white. After the evening meal, they would lie around the fire on the ground through the long evening and tell stories and sing until as late as 10 or 11 o'clock at night. Wow, that's late. They, this was the finest part of their lives. Here was the real family circle. The long evenings were spent about the fires in the most pleasant way imaginable. I wonder if you guys do anything like that. Every night was a bonfire party. The old sages would tell stories about their own experiences when they were young or about the history of their tribe or just simply stories they may have made up. We youngsters would sit around with our mouths and eyes and ears open and listen until we had to go to bed. Three musical instruments were used, sometimes all at once, and sometimes as an accompaniment to singing. They used a sort of flute made of a hollow elder limb. This made a shrill whistling sound. I, have, I never heard the Indians themselves whistle except in signaling to each other. They had a clapper made of a split stick. They struck this against something in time to the flute. Or instead of the clapper, they sometimes beat on a section of log with any stick that came handy. I believe that some of these logs were hollow or had been hollowed out on the underside. Probably the best sounding musical instrument was a short bow. It was smaller than their hunting bow. They placed one end of the back of this against their teeth and thumbed the string like one would a guitar raising and lowering the pitch with the mouth. This music used to accompany their singing. Some of their songs were quite monotonous, that means kind of boring, but some of them were very pretty. When the men were hunting, they sometimes used to go along with their bows strung and play them in the same way as they did the musical instrument, using an arrow to strike the string. As the evening wore on and various individuals grew tired or sleepy, they would wander off to bed. They would go inside and lie down on the Thule mattresses next to the walls of the house with our feet to the fire and cover up with a rabbit skin blanket or whatever the weather demanded. We slept in the clothing we had been wearing during the day. We had no shoes or other clothing to take off unless the weather was extremely cold when we might have a wild cat or mountain skin about our shoulders. The end of chapter eight. Wow, that was really cool. I learned so much. So I hope you like these pictures. The salt, their acorns, the mortar and pestle. This is a picture of making some food with the mortar of pestle on a piece of wood, or maybe that's a stone. These are from the book, some different baskets, and the wild oats.